Good evening and welcome to Metro Focus. I'm Jack Ford. Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, 1989. For many, it conjures memories of one of the most painful racial incidents in New York City's history, the killing of 16-year-old Yusuf Hawkins. Hawkins, a black teen, was set upon by a white mob and fatally shot. His cold-blooded murder horrified the city and the entire country, setting off months of protest marches and paving the way for the election of New York's first black mayor, David Dinkins. The name Bensonhurst became a national symbol of hate, but in the 30 years since Hawkins' death, the once heavily Italian neighborhood has been diversified. Seeking to find out how the tragedy is remembered today, the news outlet The City traveled to Bensonhurst to investigate, and journalist Clifford Michelle is here with his findings. Clifford, nice to have you here with us. Thank you so much for having me. Let's set the stage for our viewers here. 30 years ago, uh, I remembered I was just starting in television news. As a matter of fact, I was working as, as a legal analyst for Channel 2 News here in New York City. Yeah. Um, so I remember the story, but just give us a sense of how this all played out as a backdrop to, to your investigation and our conversation. Yeah, so on August 23rd, 1989, Yusuf Hawkins and three of his buddies got out of the N train on 20th Avenue, um, and he was just looking to buy a used 1982 Pontiac. And almost immediately after, he was engulfed, surrounded by these white teenagers who several of them were had baseball bats, golf clubs, and just within a few blocks, they had surrounded him and a gunman, the gunman, Joseph Fama um, shot him twice in the chest. Talk about what the Bensonhurst neighborhood was like then. It's, it's yeah. complexion, if yeah. you will, it's composition yeah. uh, 30 years ago. So it was a predominantly white, working class Italian neighborhood. Um, pizzerias everywhere, um, and just a majority homeowner neighborhood as well. And the complexion of that neighborhood has changed intensely since then. Um, but back then, you know, only three days after the shooting, um, you know, black organizers got together and immediately they were offset by people yelling racial epithets at them, some of them holding... Even after the shooting, still, still being attacked racially. Yeah, and some people actually holding watermelons, believe it or not, just as a form of ridicule at the time. And it sharply divided the neighborhood. What, what were you looking for when, when the decision was made? Let, let's take a look at this. Let's go back 30 years. Let's go yeah. back to Bensonhurst. Uh, what, what was the idea? I wanted to see what the neighborhood remembered. And honestly, what I found was a neighborhood that has deeply changed. Um, there are still remnants of that old neighborhood, but now we're looking at a neighborhood that's 55% of the population is foreign born. So many of them are from China, Turkey, Pakistan, Uzbekistan. And you see these old school pizzerias, they're still there in all these Italian eateries, but across the street, you'll see a huge Chinese buffet. You'll see a huge Turkish eatery at the same time. and now it's actually minority majority in, in the sense where it's, I believe it's only 44% are, are white. When you ask people, this is general obviously, but when you asked about, about the Yusuf Hawkins shooting, yeah. how many did you find actually remembered it, were aware of it in any way, shape, or form? I mean, dozens, dozens, truly, especially those who were homeowners and still had their homes in that neighborhood. They did remember the shooting, and they did remember, in particular, the marches that were organized by Reverend Al Sharpton back then. But when I talked to some of the people who moved more recently, the memory is starting to fade a bit. We're talking 30 years later. I talked to one individual who was shocked that that could happen as they broke I was going to ask you about that because I, yeah. I, I noted that, that someone was essentially saying to you, yeah. really, here? Yeah. I never could have imagined yeah. that? Yeah. I mean, the DNA of the neighborhood is much the same. It's somewhere where, it's a place where people want to raise their families. And when I talk to a lot of people who have moved there, um, the one individual, Mohammed from Syria, he was absolutely rattled but we're talking about an incident that absolutely shaped a neighborhood uh, defined a neighborhood for it um, and it has very much changed since then um, and I think when people who have more recently in recent years moved to the neighborhood they're just surprised that something like that could happen so it was was your sense after spending some time there 
uh, you know, going back to, to the racial animus mm -hmm. that existed in 1989, did you find any semblance of that at all? There were a couple of people I spoke to who felt that the marches painted their neighborhood in a bad light and really pushed back on the sentiment that it was a, a racial incident actually and that it was a racist attack. Um, and they felt more that these were young teenagers uh, who got into a fight and that was all to it. Um, of course, that's not what everyone said. I talked to one family um, who actually, they lived on 20th Avenue where the shooting occurred and they left. They actually sold their home. They were so affected by it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you mentioned the, the, the two young men who were convicted of this and there's an interesting part of your story where you talk about Keith Mandela, who was convicted of, of lesser offenses, yeah. not the second degree murder that Joseph Farmer yes. was convicted of. He's still in prison. Mm -hmm. And you talk about a, a contact between Keith Mandela and a family member of Yusuf yeah. Hawkins. Tell me about that. Yeah, Moses Stewart, um, Hawkins' father, uh, after Mandela got out of prison, he first uh, sent in a letter to the family, but he also reconciled with the father in uh, late 1998, and they actually got together and he apologized and the father accepted the apology. It's a different story when it comes to the mother, um, but yeah, they did reconcile before the father passed away. When you say a different story with regard to the mother, how? She has been quoted over and over in the anniversaries saying that this is a wound that will never heal in her heart something that she's going to take to the grave and that she acknowledges the apologies, she does not accept them. Last question for you. You, you talk about mother, of course, remembering the yeah. death of her son. Um, we talked about how much coverage this got at the time. It, it's interesting, I think, to see how much Yusuf Hawkins' memory is still ingrained, especially in some er levels of pop culture. Yeah. Um, it just uh, how is he? How has he been remembered? How has his memory uh, been kept alive in many ways mm -hmm. uh, through various, as I said, pop culture means? Yeah, I think you can definitely point to Spike Lee's film as one example. Uh, Do the right thing when you look at a neighborhood um, that reminds you a lot of Bensonhurst and communities clashing and racial tensions truly coming to a boil. Um, also, I think in following years, you saw his name uh, littered over hip hop tracks everywhere. It was something that had really shook the neighborhood. Yeah. Well, it, it, it's, an, it's a very interesting look back yeah. uh, at what a, a, a difficult time and place and how it's changed yeah. in the period of the three decades. Clifford, thanks so much for spending some time with us. We appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much you for inviting me. Thank you.